All I have to do this morning to open, open the last day of our conference up is to introduce our executive director, Kate Meese, who will then lay out our morning's entertainment. Good morning. I'm impressed that so many of you made it here this morning. You got your coffee, and clearly there weren't too many of you out checking out the breweries last night because you're, you're here and you look fairly awake, so that's a, a good start. So I'm very pleased to be introducing this topic because I think it's a critical and timely topic. Given a number of the challenges that we're facing in communities, we absolutely need to be thinking more creatively thinking about private sector type solutions and thinking about partnerships that we could leverage with, with the private sector. And my goal this morning in introducing a great plenary that we have today is to address three influencing factors that I think necessitate changing the business model at the community level. And that first factor is growing population and urbanization. Second, declining resources at the community level. And then the third is the uncertainty and risk that climate change is presenting to our communities. So our population in the United States has grown by an average of two million people a year over the last five years. And just in 2016, we're expected to have an average increase of one person every 17 seconds. So as this presentation goes on, you can just think about how our population is growing. And increasingly, that population is being located in our urban centers. 83% of our population, they're urban dwellers. So this has a big influence on the cities that you are all leading and working in. And this is a global trend. This is true worldwide. For the first time ever in our history, in 2007, our urban population started to surpass our rural population. So as we think about what that's gonna mean for cities, as we think about increased infrastructure demands, increased services, this is gonna have a major impact that we need to be paying attention to. And this is at a time when we can't maintain our existing infrastructure. We have a $3.6 trillion deficit just to maintain our existing infrastructure through 2020. Just fixing our water pipes alone is estimated to cost a trillion dollars over the next 25 years. So this is a huge impact that we need to be paying attention to. And as we look at our communities, we're continuing to see some modest improvement in our, our local economies, but not enough to make up for the last six years. This was a survey done by the National League, and in most cities are reporting that they're seeing an increase in infrastructure costs, an increase of costs to all sorts of, of services and benefits that they need to provide. Most cities are seeing an increase in state and federal mandates, and most cities at the same time are seeing a decrease in state and federal funding. So this is gonna mean a whole new level of creativity as we look for community solutions. And part of that creativity will need to be how do we leverage the private sector dollars that are available. Climate change is going to introduce even greater uncertainty and greater risk into the system and create even more challenges for our infrastructure and for our public health. If you look at these extreme weather events, and we've seen this year after year, and this is just 2014, the expenses that we're already facing because of climate change. In 2015, Citigroup reported an estimated $192 trillion cost of inaction on climate change. If we don't do something, we're gonna see increasing impacts in our communities. So there's a necessity to act on this, despite the challenges. And this message is taking root. In December, we had 195 nations agree to take action on climate change. And if you think about what's happening in Congress, now we can't agree on anything. To have 195 nations all come together and say that we have to act on climate change, that's a big deal. And 
And at the conference of parties where this agreement was reached, there was a large recognition that it, this is not just a global issue. This is not just about nations. There is a large role for subnational entities as well, and in particular, cities. And there's good reason that they recognize this. Cities generate, they make up 80% of the world's GDP. They're responsible for about 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. And as I said, our populations live there, about 50% worldwide and even higher in the United States at 83%. So as we think about moving forward, as we think about these large challenges that we have to face with limited funds to face these challenges, we have to be creative. We can no longer afford to have our public dollars spent in a way that achieves one benefit. We have to achieve multiple benefits for every public dollar spent, and we need to figure out how to leverage additional private sector funds along with those dollars that we're spending. And at the nexus of meeting the needs of our growing cities and the climate change impacts we're going to be facing are electricity and transportation as the sectors that have the largest, are responsible for the largest amount of greenhouse gas emissions. So communities and corporations that understand this can position themselves to be at the forefront of the clean economy moving forward. So I'm going to present a couple opportunities in this space, and I'm calling them disruptive innovations because I recognize these solutions aren't without their controversy. They are not intended to be silver bullets, but they're intended to spark a discussion about emerging markets, about potential partnerships, and about areas where the public sector can get involved with new innovative solutions to meet growing needs. We've seen corporations tapped into large markets, growing markets, with huge financial success. And the ability to have huge environmental impacts for good or bad as well. And we're obviously talking here about how we can optimize the good benefits out of these services. Uber is worth $40 billion, and they don't own a single car. This is at a time when we can't afford new public transit, and we certainly can't afford to, to maintain our existing transit. So we need to be paying attention to these trends. And companies that understand that there's a shift away from a preference for ownership towards a preference for access are able to position themselves well in, in the new economy. They understand that you compare technology to connect people to the places they want to go and to the services that they need. Car sharing in the United States has increased by almost threefold. So there's a large increase already in people that are saying, I don't need to own my own car. And we're already seeing tremendous environmental benefits. There's been an average of 35% reduction in vehicle miles traveled for people who join car sharing, and an average of $300 in household savings per month for people who are taking this on. And this is critical that we find innovations in this space. Our cars are sitting idle 23 hours of the day. For the cars that are on our crumbling congested roads, 80% of those seats are empty. So there's a tremendous room for innovation in this space. We're already seeing services like Uberpool and Liftline that are starting to get more people into those cars. So Liftline has been available in San Francisco and LA for about a year and a half, and they've already seen that an average of 50% of their rides are taking advantage of this carpool option. That's substantial if you think about how much public investment has gone into trying to get people to carpool with fairly nominal results. And it's even more astounding when you think about the fact that Lyft says 90% of their rides, there's another person taking that ride within five minutes. 
So I'm willing to bet that a large portion of those people would wait a few minutes if their fare could be split in half or split even further than that. So there's large potential here. And while this says, you know, match Muni and kind of makes a joke about we can offer such low rides that we're matching the public transit, to me, the opportunity is not to match Muni. The opportunity is to provide access in areas where there isn't Muni, where there isn't public transit, and there's an opportunity to connect to the transit that exists. Lyft in the Bay Area has said that 20% of their rides start and end at transit. So if you think about the potential of first mile, last mile, and of leveraging these companies to serve our, our, our neighborhoods and areas that do not have transit, the potential could be fairly substantial. Again, these aren't without their controversy, but they are a growing part of our local economies, and a number of local governments are seeing that there is some benefit to that. So the question is, how do we address the concerns? Because there are real concerns. How do we address, address concerns about safety and liability? How do we address concerns about our traditional services and our traditional workers? And how do we optimize the benefit side of this? How do we provide even more increased services? How do we provide even more economic development? And how do we provide equitable access to these services? The second critical sector is energy. As we look at climate change and increased temperatures due to climate change, and we think about our growing cities, we're going to have a real stress to our grid, and we're going to have a huge problem on our hands with additional energy use and greenhouse gas emissions if we're not innovating in this space. And one of the major barriers to advanced energy communities has been energy storage. Tesla created major waves last year when they announced this, their new power wall, battery pack storage. This has the potential to make storing energy from your solar panels during the day to power your home and charge your electric vehicle at night a reality. They have 100,000 reservations for these already worth a billion dollars. So this could be a major game changer. And especially when you combine that with financing to make it accessible to more people. How many of you have PACE financing in your state or in your communities? So Property Assessed Clean Energy provides financing to do energy and water upgrades on your homes and your businesses. It's provided no cost up front to local homeowners. They're able to do these large upgrades and pay for it through the savings on their utility bills. Just in California, our largest PACE provider, private PACE provider, Hero, has financed over a billion dollars in projects to over 50,000 homes, creating 10,000 plus local jobs, creating savings for homeowners across the state in over $2.2 billion. These are substantial energy reduction, greenhouse gas emission reductions, and water reductions. They work in partnership with communities, but this is all private sector funding, having major results in communities. These are the type of win-win strategies that we need to be able to identify. And this is increasingly available throughout the nation. So this could be, again, another game changer. So again, the question is, how do we assure that the communities that we serve are getting the benefits out of these innovations, whether it's the ones I talked about or other private sector partnerships or private sector type solutions? Because we know if these strategies aren't utilized in a way that lifts up our most disadvantaged community, communities, that don't lift up our residents that need these solutions the most, it's not smart growth. And we're not going to have economic prosperity, and we're going to continue to have political unrest. 
And we've talked about this throughout the conference, but we can't continue to have residents' life outcomes more determined by their zip code than their genetic code. So we have to do better. What we need is a vision that we can fight for together, that's worth fighting for. We need to have a tomorrow, a future, that looks better than it does today. We need to have a future for Ron Sims' grandkids, for Puck's kids, for all of our kids and grandkids that is better than what residents are experiencing now. So thank you for being here, and I look forward to the discussion that we're going to have. And at this point, it's my great pleasure to welcome LGC board member and Sacramento City Council member Steve Hansen, who's going to be facilitating the discussion. Good morning, everybody. Steve has been a tireless advocate of civil rights, and he has been a huge advocate of government reform. He's turned Sacramento around using an open data platform. He's utilizing technology. He's really been a game changer in our community, looking at private partnerships, looking at partnerships with communities to create these innovative, creative solutions we need and has been a great advocate of smart growth in our community. So thank you for being here, Steve. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Are you all awake? There's more coffee in the back. Feel free to avail yourself. It is Saturday morning. Um, well, it's my great pleasure today to moderate this conversation amongst two very impressive people. I was going to sit between them in case it got a little bit more interesting, but they said they would be fine and keep it interesting on their own. So uh, I, I'm going to welcome to the stage first uh, Peter Lucchetti. Peter, please join us. Peter is the uh, founder of Table Rock Capital, LLC, an infrastructure fund that invests in transportation, energy, social infrastructure, water, and waste. He was appointed by the governor of California to the California Infrastructure Bank and also serves on the Beria Council Economic Institute Board of Directors. Peter, welcome. Thank you. Um, next, uh, one of our frequent and often collaborators here at LGC, Rick Cole, is going to join us on the stage. And, uh, Rick was uh, previously at the city of LA. He was um, uh, deputy city administrator for innovation and budget, I believe. Deputy mayor. Deputy mayor. Um, but at a conference two years ago, the people in Santa Monica saw Rick present and very smartly, since they had most of their city council there, and a city manager position was coming open, they decided to recruit Rick away from the city of LA. In last July, he became city manager in Santa Monica. So welcome, Rick. Congratulations on the new position. And thank you, thank you all for joining us. So um, we're going to kick this off. I think since Rick is kind of used to being on the hot spot as a city manager, we're going to start with Rick. Um, Rick. You've played a lot of critical roles in different cities, from Pasadena to now Santa Monica. Um, what are you seeing in terms of uh, private partnerships and public sector type uh, solutions to some of the challenges that we're talking about? In the darkest days of World War II, uh, one of the members of uh, the British War Cabinet uh, told his colleagues, we are out of money. We are going to have to think. <laughs> and I think we're at one of those inflection points for the public sector. Um, what's going on in the world economy is not altogether comfortable. Uh, we live in a time of global dynamism. We see investments flowing into and out of communities beyond the control of those communities. And so it's a destabilizing time. And I'm not here to say that it is a good time. I'm not here to say that it is altogether positive for communities. I am here to say we have to deal with it. Um, we have to deal with it by thinking globally and acting locally. I don't think we have to surrender to Wall Street. 
In fact, I think that is a bad bet. But I do think we have to pay attention to the extraordinary dynamism of the, public se of the private sector, and we have to move from a static model of public services and public investment to a more dynamic one. Let me give you a very quick story. Who here knows the first fire department in America? Do you all have a fire department? Everyone has a fire department. It is automatic. It is static. It is what government does. We have a fire department. We have a police department. We have a parks department. We have a recreation department. We have a planning department. That's what we think cities are here for, is to provide those services. But there was a time when there was no fire department. It was 1853 in America. So America had been around for 75 years without any fire departments. The way fires were fought was the insurance company, if you paid your premiums, would come and put your fire out. If you didn't pay your premiums, a bandit fire outfit would show up and bargain with you. The higher the flames, the higher the price. And there was a third model, the kind of model that most of the people in this room would, would relate to. It was a volunteer model, started by Benjamin Franklin back in Boston. But as our cities got bigger, and more dangerous. The volunteers were overwhelmed, and so Cincinnati burned down in 1852. And the guy whose factory started the fire went back to his factory, rebuilt it, and started making new, improved fire engines. And the city of Cincinnati bought the fire engine and hired a municipal crew. So in fact, all of the things that we now take for granted about cities were once disruptive innovations. We once were entrepreneurs. We started public libraries. We started public schools. We started parks and recreation. Now we think we have to just keep them going. But the world has changed. So I think we have to pay attention to what's going on in the private sector, and we have to become entrepreneurs again. Maybe if I could just ask a quick follow-up. Um, I know um, it may be somewhat unique to the experience we're dealing with, but sometimes government disrupts. And in California, with the demise of uh, pr public capital through redevelopment agencies, uh, the governor and the legislature abolished those sources of funds. That seems to me to have been very disruptive as well to cities who are trying to plan projects and figure out how to carry forward an agenda of infill and smart growth. Um, has that, you know, sort of reverse um, invention, or I don't know, I guess you could call it disinnovation, uh, from the public side impacted what you're doing in Santa Monica? Um, in some ways, clearly. Um, in, for most California cities, we have 488 cities in California, and about half of them had redevelopment agencies, and almost all of them, Santa Monica being an exception, uh, subsidized private real estate development with it. So it was disruptive in the same sense that taking away cocaine from an addict is disruptive. Um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the reality is, is that we were playing the wrong game. Instead of investing in public infrastructure, as Santa Monica did, uh, we were investing in private development and we were having our shirts taken. So, and, and it was so um, essential, cities thought it was so essential that they, um, that they went to court and challenged the governor, as you well know, and lost a, a big gamble, a uh, stupid gamble, as it turns out. I think the lesson for the other 49 states uh, is, is that they didn't have redevelopment. Most states have some form of, of tax increment financing, but none that, that have used it as, as uh, radically as, as California. I think, again, the lesson for all 50 states is government has to become more nimble. Government has to become more entrepreneurial. Government has to become more innovative because we have big challenges and we are not going to get there the way we are um, uh, fixed now. We don't have the capital to do that and we have to generate that capital. We'll talk more and I'm interested in, in getting Peter into this conversation because we're gonna talk more about something that most people who are in planning departments or in uh, nonprofit organizations or in community development groups, which make up a great uh, number of the new partners here today, we don't like to talk about capital. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to talk about capital because that's where the money is. 
So you can tell he's a great city manager because he just tried to redirect the council member to what, someone else. <laughs> did, you, did, did you all see that? Did you see? That was going to be my segue, and, and Rick took it. So uh, clearly I'm dealing with a very experienced ninja over here. <laughs> but Peter, now that we've put you on the spot, and uh, we're having this sort of interesting notion bandied about with the removal of, pro of public capital, uh, how we as uh, jurisdictions kind of look at this opportunity, I think that this is a perfect time to bring our private sector guy in and tell us whether or not the, there has been some kind of addiction. Uh, I don't know if it would be cocaine addled or fueled, but um, to public capital. And, you know, Peter here, um, as I mentioned, has been uh, very involved in a lot of private sector places, but uh, what do you think about that very provocative notion that public capital distorts, and especially given your role on the infrastructure bank? By the way, we just financed a new uh, theater project for a private theater company in Sacramento with the help of the California Infrastructure Bank, which was a very complicated project, not normally the type that would be underwritten by a um, private lender without some significant support. Um, but it is a transformational project for the B Street Theater Company. And, and I, I don't know, I'm, I'm curious to hear what you're thinking. Well, I, I think that, first of all, I want to thank Rick for setting up the conversation really nicely because oftentimes, you know, coming from the pub private sector side of the conversation, if I walk into a room and say, you know, we have a once in a 50 or once in 100 year crisis in public finance, and I'm from the private sector, people say, well, of course you're gonna say that. You know, that's what I would expect some for the private sector to say. That's your opportunity, I can't tr maybe I can't trust you, it's coming from your mouth, I, you know, I really need to hear that uh, more generally. So I do appreciate the way you set it up. I think it's really important to explain to everyone that this is a different kind of economy. This is not our mother and father's, our last generation's economy. We are really gonna be challenged. You look at the D plus that was up on the slide that Kate presented, and the amount of money it's gonna to take to fix it, and then you look at revenue and you look at income streams, federal, state, and local, we have a considerable issue with a mismatch between revenues and expenses. And that's gonna be systemic and permanent for a long period of time, maybe not forever, but for a long time. Look at demographics, that's part of it. You look at globalization is part of it. So let's pause there and you know, switch now to the to the question at hand, you know, what does the private sector have to do with it? What is the dynamic between public finance and private finance? Well, let's start with the tax exempt financing on municipal bonds for a, for a moment. Just talk about that for a moment. You know, it's a, it's a subsidy. It's an indiscriminate subsidy in the sense that any community can use it for any project. So it really doesn't necessarily promulgate social equity. Uh, maybe some communities need it more than others. It's a scarce resource. Maybe it should be allocated more efficiently. Uh, it certainly has resulted over a 50 or lo year longer period of time in the perfection of a concept or perception of how development in cities and capitalization of assets works. So it's sort of a one trick pony. You know, if you do something the same way for a really, really, really long time, it becomes a one trick pony. The innovation gets drained out of it. The lawyers, the bankers, the staff, the planners, Everybody is used to doing it. I hear it every day when I walk into cities across the country. Why are you here? We have a process for doing this. We have tax exempt financing. I don't know why you're here. Why don't you go home? That's the typical response that I get. Go home. I, we don't need you here. I like the locus of control I have around tax exempt financing. So, you know, you have to really weigh in your mind those issues the social inequity or equity of it, the use of it, and the process. So let's turn to the process for a moment. This is another challenge I get all the time. You're coming here and you're offering a view of alternative procurement that might mix the skill set of the private sector with the skill sets of the public sector. It might mix private capital with public capital. Typically in most projects in the United States today, if you're gonna mix private capital with public capital, you might have a question about what part is tax exempt and what part is taxable. You might have a question about multiple sources of public finance. Most projects, large projects today, might have 16, 17, 18, 20 different sources of public finance. 
You say, you're crazy. How could you have 20 sources of public finance? Well, Rick understands. The port might throw in a few dollars. The city of LA might throw in a few dollars. A community that's impacted along the way might throw in a few dollars. The federal government might throw in a few dollars. Let's say it's water. The EPA Finance Center might throw in a few dollars. Let's, we might get some SRF funding. We might get some funding from the iBank. And, and Peter, I think most people would, would understand that that's how affordable housing gets financed. So I think for a lot of the people in the audience, they would understand um, multiple sources, the layer cake kind of financing. Okay, so let me just say that when you add all that up and you think about how we're behaving together, what needs to happen, I think, in order to ch achieve what has become a sort of global standard for the integration of public and private finance is, can we in the United States achieve what has become a sort of standard mantra? There's 15 to 30 percent, and in some cases 50 percent, life cycle cost savings available by being really smart about the way you use the skills and the sources of capital from the public sector and the private sector at the same time. So if, and how do you do that at the same time? And we can have that conversation. And, and but Steve, you know, how do you make that happen? And Steve, I think it, it's, it's yes, important Mr. City Manager? to pause um, for a minute and, and back up because there's a, a wide range in the public sector of uh, sophistication about this kind of stuff um, from abysmally low to pretty good. Um, about which kind of stuff? Just uh, about, general, about, about finance? About, about the kind of finance that Peter's talking about. Yeah. And the trouble is um, we're almost always on the other side of the table from people who are extraordinarily sophisticated yes. at this. They do it for a living and some of the smartest people in the world and some of the best paid people in the world. So I think it's really important for, for communities and organizations and all of you to walk before you run and maybe even to crawl before you walk. Because if you leap from, uh, from an unsophisticated uh, understanding of these things to, to dealing with, frankly, some of the sharks in the private sector. Um, so we've heard you, you sort of intimate in your opening about not surrendering to Wall Street and now you're sort of bringing that, that idea back that there's what, an imbalance in the power, but, but... What I'm suggesting is that the public sector needs to up its game. We need to, we need to understand... How do we do that? Let me debate that with Rick yeah, for a second. Yeah, please. Let me debate it with Rick, because I want to role play... Do you want play. me to sit I between you? I want to role play it with Rick for a moment. That's good. I want to role play, because I think Rick will en enjoy this. So, Rick, one answer... Will they? <laughs> well, I think they will, too. One, one, one answer coffee. is, and I see, we, we confront this all the time, so I want to tell you how we're pitching our product right now. Mm -hmm. And it's working in Wichita, Kansas, it's working in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, we're in the middle of a procurement in Santa Clara for a potable reuse facility and a pipeline. It's a $900 million uh, infrastructure project. Sure. Uh, so here's how we're pitching it. Um, instead of doing hard bid P3, which is a public-private sector partnership, which results in the private public sector hiring a bunch of consultants on its side and running a process that could last one, two, or three years. There's a lot of consultant work that goes into it. It ends up costing millions of dollars, and it takes that one, two, or three years. What we've proposed in Wichita, Jackson, and Santa Clara, and it seems to be making traction in all three places because we've won two mandates, Jackson and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, Wichita. Now we're trying to win Santa Clara is, let's enter into a, basically a development agreement together to do progressive design build. Mm -hmm. And we'll overlay the financial analysis in the P3 on the progressive design build. We'll provide a complete model, transparent, we'll give you the model, of all the financing alternatives. So take, for example, in Wichita, we have CH2M Hills, a design engineering firm, doing the progressive design build. Tabrock looking at the equity, and Goldman Sachs looking at the financing overall. That's our team. And we've now partnered with the city of Wichita on a phase one, phase two process. And our obligation to the city council in the first nine months is deliver all the options. And if we don't like it at the end of nine months, we're gonna send you home and you're out of the deal. You're off, off on your way, out, off on your way. And, it, and if you exercise the off ramp, you get to keep the work product, but you have to pay the design and engineering fee for the progressive design bill, which was disclosed up front and is capped. So that's better than say what's going on in Corpus Christi, Texas right now, we lost the argument in Corpus Christi where they said, no, we're gonna hire a consultant for $2 million, we're gonna get a consultant study in two years, and then we'll have a conversation about methods of procurement. So what I'm, what I'm trying to pitch is let's speed that conversation up, give the public sector the protection it needs not to get run off the rails, so they're off ramps, 
and make it transparent. And I think uh, a public sector entity that was capable of playing with the big boys um, could get extraordinary benefits from that. My concern is the ability to play with the big boys. Uh, city of Los Angeles, you may have heard of it, <laughs> has a $7.8 billion budget and doesn't have a chief financial officer. Um, the, the four, the four um, fiscal functions that would ordinarily be in a chief financial officer, Chicago has one, Philadelphia has one, Washington, D.C. has one. Um, the four functions are, are, are divided between an elect, two elected officials, um, an appointed official and, and who reports to the mayor, and an appointed official who reports to the mayor and council. So that's, that's how disaggregated. I, I think we can all agree LA is not the example <laughs> of a best run city. So I win this bet all the time. It's, it's one of the two surest bets I can win. One, one bet I always win is the percentage of poverty in Santa Monica, which most people think is 0.03, um, is actually 13%. Uh, so we're a much more diverse community than people think. Um, and the other bet I win is of, of the top 20 cities in America, um, who has the, the best pension, um, or the lowest pension liabilities, the, the best percentage of, of their pensions covered uh, by invested assets. Anybody wanna, wanna pick? I don't hear many it's, guesses. It's, it's, it's not one you would think, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't win the bets. It's Washington, D.C., which was a fiscal <laughs> basket case 20 years ago. And the reason they have um, the best covered pensions is because Congress imposed a chief financial officer who's incredibly smart and has a lot of power. So, um, you know, what, what Peter's describing uh, is the equivalent of fiscal magic, right? It's the ability to, to turn a problem into a solution and to find millions or billions of dollars um, to, to solve those things. But you can't rely on a magician from Goldman Sachs to do that for you if you don't have the same level of sophistication on your side of the table. That's all I'm saying. I am not saying what Bernie Sanders says, which is you know, that, uh, that we ought to get rid of Wall Street. What I'm saying is if, if we're going to do uh, if we're going to solve the problems that Kate so eloquently laid out of billions of dollars, of trillions, really, of dollars of needed public investment, we have to be sophisticated. There was a time when people believed that the public sector could put a man on the moon. Now we're not persuaded the public sector can fill a pothole. And the, the, the loss of competence and the loss of confidence um, is because we have fallen behind. And we either catch up, like Washington, D.C. did, or we are at the mercy of Wall Street. We don't want to be there. Can we, it, 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 you know, just, just as a governing board member, I feel like, you know, as a council member, you know, uh, we, look, we look into the uh, abyss ourselves sometimes and wonder if we're getting it right. But I'll say, um, Oftentimes, we're not sure whether our staff is right or the external people are right, so we have to make a judgment call. And in the end, uh, a lot of times the judgment call is not to wait an extra two or three years to see if the conclusions reached by our staff, or maybe even the outside, are right. We just have to make a decision, and sometimes a lack of a decision is worse than a decision uh, to do something. And I guess um, the, the challenge here, and, and Peter, I know that you're, you want to get in on this, is that we're not going to build every project in the city. A city isn't competent necessarily to do that, to use your word. So how do we make the system function? Because if we want more infill, more smart growth, part of it's to make um, offsite improvements less burdensome because we do have infrastructure that is up to par and we don't have to place those costs on the projects that are just getting proposed on infill sites, because sometimes that is 15 to 20% of the cost, depending on uh, whether it's uh, how, how, um, how available the infrastructure is. But also, um, you know, and I think this is where Peter, uh, talking about some of these uh, opportunities to share risk, not necessarily share risk between the public sector and the private sector, but share risk uh, in the sense of, instead of um, only giving grants, which is oftentimes where the public sector is put, and, and the developers sometimes do just want a gift of public funds, to put it very bluntly, 
or a grant of public funds, but we've begun, we've begun to create um, these financing tools like the Infrastructure Bank, which are loans, low interest loans or loans on terms that are reasonable, but for marginal projects, infill development, multifamily housing, affordable housing, TODs, they wouldn't exist otherwise. And so, so, so before, Peter- So before, before we let- No, Peter hasn't had a thing to say. I know, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give him, a, I'm gonna, I'm going to give him an opportunity to not have to defend uh, something that I don't think he needs to defend. There are ways in which this can be done right. And let me point to a specific example that I have nothing to do with, but I am a big admirer of. The city of Riverside, California, an older uh, city in, in, um, in California's uh, inland empire. Um, they were being passed up by the newer suburbs all around them. Mm -hmm. And they entered into what they called the Riverside Renaissance, which was a public-private partnership, a comprehensive program to renew their infrastructure. They used redevelopment funds wisely. Um, they borrowed money wisely. Um, they taxed uh, their citizens because the citizens could see that they were um, investing all of the public resources that existed, the redevelopment money, the grants from uh, state and federal government, uh, their own internal resources, and so the citizens were, were willing to say, gosh, we're getting new libraries, we're getting new fire stations, we're getting new railroad underpasses, so I will pay a tax to fix our sidewalks too. And so when you do have a sophisticated, smart group of people who uh, know what they're doing, you actually can have remarkable results and you can play on an even playing field with the private sector. All I'm warning, is you don't jump into the pool before you realize what you need to, uh, to do to be able to swim, sometimes with sharks. Let me okay, try Peter. to yeah. help address that point specifically, and then we can move on to a couple other interesting elements. Yeah. You know, I, I agree with Rick. I, I think transparency is very important, and I think reducing the fear that you might get outsmarted by the private sector is very, very important. So let's agree that the public sector should have adequate resources on its side to have participate in the conversation. Now, there are a couple ways to do that, but I have a word of caution on it, and, I, and I, I think everybody ought to really embrace this word of caution. When you hire resources on your side, how do you structure that arrangement relative to what goes on on the private side? And take, for example, the deal that's just been done in Long Beach on the Civic Center, which mm -hmm. I think is really mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. If you're not familiar with the Long Beach Civic Center deal, I'll try to say it in one sentence. They were paying about $12.5 million a year to maintain a civic center downtown on five acres with a big tower that was built in the 1970s that would fall down in an earthquake and they needed a new public building. So the question was, could they go to the private sector, would the private sector build them a brand new civic center and rehabilitate the entirety of the five square blocks downtown, including a park that was full of homeless people, for $12.5 million a year, escalated at the rate of inflation? That's the same amount they're paying now to maintain what they have. Would the private sector do that? And on what terms? Okay, to be clear, they hired Arup to sit on their side of the table. And people probably don't. Know who Arup is? Mm -hmm. Arup is one of the leading design engineering firms in the world, and they have a transaction advisory group that advises people in the public sector how to sit across people from the table from people in the private sector. So does Ernst & Young, so does KPMG, so do a bunch of other smaller firms. I just mentioned some of the bigger names. Mm -hmm. But the key thing here is our upset on their side of the table. The word of caution that I have, and I'd ask, actually like to get your help on this point, is be very careful when you run that contract relative to the conversation with the private sector because there's sort of two, I've seen it go two ways. It tends to morph over to old planning and procurement, take five years and cost $10 million. And I've seen it happen, I've seen happen what just happened in Long Beach. It took 14 months during a mayoral change to run a process that had three finalists and brought an answer to the city that said, yes, we will build you a brand new civic center, noting a bunch of other things are going on on the five acres, which I won't get into, including some affordable housing and some market rate housing. So they're using real estate, a real estate model that succeeds the demise of the development uh, funding that the, that the governor uh, blew up. Uh, in Long Beach to allow the city to accomplish this goal. I would like a brand new public facility downtown for the same amount of money I'm paying now. So I, I, I in 14 months, during the change, a change in council and mayor, I think it's an amazing story and at a, 
sat, really achieves absolutely the spirit of faster, cheaper, and better uh, with transparency. So that's my, uh, that's my attempt to sort of box the issue. Get a good advisor. Don't run the process the old way. Accomplish something like what the folks down in Long Beach accomplished, and I think you're, I think you're on the right track. And let's, let's take a look away from California. Let's take a look at the sort of poster child for urban disinvestment in America, Detroit, Michigan, um, uh, where I was born in uh, uh, one city outside of it in 1953 when, as we heard um, uh, in the uh, session by the folks from Detroit, who I hope are still here, um, you know, was kind of the heyday of, of people came from all over the world to look at Detroit, Michigan. So the Renaissance Center was done in the 70s. At the time, it was the tallest hotel in the world. It was, uh, it was the shiny new object that was going to turn around Detroit. Uh, and of course, um, then it became the headquarters of uh, General Motors when they went bankrupt. Um, and then we see these incredible, promising, grassroots, entrepreneurial community development efforts. And I think where, Peter, we, we need to to, for this audience particularly, bridge the gap between what so many of these folks are doing on the ground that costs three thousand or ten thousand dollars, or or is uh, you know one four unit um, building on, in a blighted neighborhood, and these mega projects, you know, where, where the debt service is twelve million dollar, twelve and a half million dollars a year, and how do we connect those two things? Mm -hmm. And, and that's really why I'm here, is, is not that we're in an hour going to give them a 101 tutorial on how to, to do $12.5 million deals, but to connect community development to these massive flows of global capital. Um, there is a connection, because what we need to be doing ultimately is defining these grassroots community development, neighborhood-oriented, human-scale efforts making them replicable so that they can be, they can be repeated in, in neighborhood after neighborhood so that it isn't just one project in one place at one time, but it begins to be a model and ultimately so it can be scalable and that's where um, the private sector comes in. Not necessarily providing the capital, although in some cases clearly part of that capital if there's 20 sources of funding, but so that there, is, there aren't two games mega projects that come, uh, that land like, uh, like Martian spaceships in the middle of your downtown, right? A giant, you know, $1.2 billion stadium, which is the wonderful gift Los Angeles is getting. Um, and then meanwhile, we have folks who are, who are struggling, you know, to do a four unit affordable housing project. We have to marry uh, the ability to take some of that money that's now being, um, you know, sluiced into wretched excess by the National Football League um, and, and, and channel it to the very real needs of clean water for uh, people with lead pipes. And, and that's where I think, that's where I think the public sector has to up our game. We can't demonize yeah. the private sector. We can't say, oh, that's your problem, why don't you solve it? It's our problem, but we need to be sophisticated in order that we can begin to tap into some of that but, global but, capital. But Rick, I think, is, is it a zero-sum issue like you're saying, or you want, you're saying you want both to be happening? Well, I'm not because, big on, be, on $1.2 billion stadiums. Well, let, That's let me, no, no, I hear that, let but, let but also what I, what I heard you say is that somehow the public sector is responsible for, or sorry, the private sector is responsible for the, pri the public sector's decision to not maintain its infrastructure. No. And no, that's no. a very provocative. No, 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 I'm not saying that. No, what I'm saying is that we are not um, being as smart and as tough and as committed and as passionate and as innovative and as entrepreneurial as the private sector. So no wonder they're, they're taking our shorts while we're. Uh, there, 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 are so. two, there are two issues that I see. I'm speaking now from my position as vice chair of the iBank I in California. So I've switched hats. I'm not talking about Table Rock Capital right now. I'm talking about working for the governor. I'm appointed by the governor to be the vice chair of the board of the California Infrastructure and Economic Development Bank. So now I'm talking like the iBank vice chair. So let me say some, tell you something I think you, you, you'll enjoy again. Okay, who gathers around the iBank and what does the iBank do? The iBank does deals that are too small for cities to take to the public market. That's essentially what it does. 
So that's the 10 million, 4 million. In fact, I just looked at the iBank board package which came out in the email last night. There's a $1.7 million loan in it for a water district. Tiny little town. You know, I don't know if it's lead pipes or not. I haven't read the board package, but I'm sure it's something funky like a pump or a screen or ultraviolet uh, purification and, you know, getting rid of bacteria. This is usually what it is. Okay, so, you know, here we sit at the iBank and What's beautiful about it is you can apply for a $1.7 million loan at the iBank by filling out an application on the internet, if you're a city now, mm -hmm. not the public or not the private sector, the city. And, you, you know, it, the, the, the application fee for a disadvantaged city for a $1.7 million loan might be $25,000. So it's really cheap. And that application gets processed, and you'll get a yes or no within 90 days. Now, I think that's a pretty good service for that small little thing. But here's the other thing that's really kind of cool about it. Who sits over the top of the iBank and has a conversation about how it should be funded as it aggregates all this little stuff up to a size that matters? Who sits up there? Treasurer's office is there. The Office of Finance is there. I'm there. We're all talking about it. And then who comes next? Goldman Sachs comes. Barclays comes. JP Morgan comes. They're all coming to try to get our business to finance the aggregated portfolio, the $500 million offering we're going to do to, after we've gathered it all up. So I do think that is a good answer to that issue. Um, although I would add one other thing that's on a little bit different axis, I do want to say it. When I go to the local level and I talk about deals under 100 million, because that to me is the cutoff. If you're over 100 million, you can hire your own advisor. And if you're under 100 million, 100 million I don't think you really can assemble the resources you need to do a deal of the sophistication we're talking about. So, you know, that, you'll get different opinions on this, but I think amongst my peers, you'll get general agreement. Somewhere between 100 million and 150 million, you can go up into the big league, and somewhere below that, you belong down at the iBank. Uh, so, I will say this about the, what I see in local communities, particularly when you go under 100 million dollars. Unbelievable empathy, passion, and, 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 and love of wanting to solve the problem. You know, we, we talked about B Street Theater yeah. uh, at the iBank, and you know, we ultimately got together on B Street Theater. Uh, in, Not in an easy project. No, hard credit, tough conversation, but we did succeed together. And I, I think that, you know, that connecting all that passion, I, the, the one word of caution I want to put out is we ask, and this is where, I don't know where Kate is. Where's Kate She's sitting? over there. You know, I, I think Kate and the, the local government commission would be a great help here because you want to turn that passion in to a, uh, a vision of the same technical and the same analytical quality as the over $100 million deal. You want the $1.7 million deal to have the same benefit of the sophistication and understanding of how to achieve faster, cheaper, better, life cycle cost savings, transparency, better quality of life in the community, all the things we believe are true about social equity, we want to achieve all that in the under $100, under $100 million zone where there's unbelievable amount of passion for the four unit affordable housing. We want all that to happen, but I've got to tell you, I want to make sure it happens, and this is how I feel on the iBank board, with the same level of analytical rigor, the same access to the high class resources, the same sophistication as the over $100 million club. That's the goal. Which is why this is 1853, right? In 1853, we had rapidly growing wooden cities that used fire to heat, to, to run the factories, uh, and, and to light the place. And so what did we need? We needed to create fire departments. It was an urgent task. Not so urgent task now in Santa Monica in 2016. We went on 15,494 calls last year, 47 of them were for fires, okay? <laughs> so, so what we need now, and this is the argument I think we're in agreement on, what we need now are community development banks and infrastructure yeah, banks. that's true. Yeah. What we need are public institutions that are, that are created for the needs of today, right? We're not having a big problem with cities burning down, but we're spending endless gobs of money on fire departments. What, where are we um, in focusing in on getting in this game? And getting in this game means creating new public institutions that can work with private institutions at the same level and not be disadvantaged by the private sector hiring the best people out of, of Harvard and Yale and um, Stanford business schools 
and us working uh, people up from the civil service system that were a management analyst, and you know, ten years later, you're the you're the chief financial officer. Um, so we, so we, we need to be we need if you're going to be doing these kind of deals, we need new public institutions and new public talent to be able to make them happen. Well, well so just along that point. I'll, you know, in, in a city like mine, we have more firefighters on duty usually than we have police. For the very reason that you're talking about, in case there's a fire, then everybody runs to that fire, but there's so few fires, it presents a, a question of uh, use of resources. But, you know, I was inspired a few years ago to go to Philadelphia and see they have this development corp that they started in the 1950s which has become over a billion dollar entity, I think 1.3, something like that. They do hundreds of transactions a year, and essentially they loan that money out and bring it back from marginal projects. So the question I have is, there are some projects that can be commercially viable without any public um, support or public capital. And then there are some that are absolutely not viable without public capital, and usually, uh, affordable housing being one of the, the, the principal ones, without a lot of public capital, tax credit financing, all sorts of other things cobbled together into this quilt of financing. But, but talk to me about this middle ground, the projects that are somewhat marginal commercially, um, like a B Street Theater, or like maybe um, uh, an infill project in a neighborhood that is uh, in need of reinvestment, where public and private hit that sweet spot, where we can then make the projects that we all know need to happen, but don't have a natural path actually begin to blossom. What, what is that sweet spot, and how do we figure out that point? I think Peter's better able to answer that because I'm, I'm pretty suspicious of government doing those deals. Um, I, I don't think there's a, a time you want to say never, but I do think that um, public sector is not a good real estate investor. Um, but when a, you I say a, government, I, I think that, that you're lumping together a lot of different things. You're right. And so you're I right. would like you to be more specific. I'm talking about city governments. And in what form of participation? Um, Are doing, you talking about sewer credits? Are you talking about you know helping with offsite improvements? I'm, Are I'm you, talking about, about subsidies that um, that assume that we've done an analysis and we've said that an 18% return, uh, the developer will, will be fine. And so uh, there's a gap between what the developer can do to finance the deal. So let's have the public sector um, uh, come in. Now, we, we did a deal like that because it was public land mm -hmm. in Santa Monica before I got there. And uh, really smart people on the deal. So we're going to make, on a project that produced 160 affordable units a block from the beach. We're going to produce on the rest of the deal, because uh, we, we are capturing some of their profits on the rest of the deal. It's mostly um, market rate housing and, and some uh, ground floor commercial, between 16 and $24 million of return to the public sector on a single deal that produced 160. So, so that was done remarkably Over what well. span is that? over the life of the project? Well, um, it's, it's over um, the sale of, of the market rate okay. units. Um, we, we can see our way clear. We're getting our first $2.4 million check uh, in a couple months. Um, so, so, so it was really smart mm -hmm. deal. But would you do that deal again? Would I do it? I would do that deal all day and all night. Um, but I, think, I think you have a responsibility I know you have a responsibility to bring staff memos to city council that reflect what a city council should do as a public entity. And to your point, there are aspects of financing some of these uh, uh, projects that you're referring to that don't meet that criteria. And uh, you know, then you go to the private sector and they'll tell you, well, it doesn't meet our criteria either. All right, so now it doesn't meet the public criteria, it doesn't meet the private criteria. Then we come to the B Street Theater. All right, that's, that's, a great, that's a great case study, mm -hmm. I think, in what we're talking about, since you were involved in it. I was very much involved as you an You come advocate. to the B Street yeah. Theater, which had, uh, uh, had to achieve a very large growth in ticket sales in order to justify building, design, build, construction, design, build, finance, operate, and maintain of a new theater. We're talking movies? No, this uh, is a children's place. Children's Theater. It's a ch the Children's uh, Theater of California. 
right. does a lot of shows, goes out to schools. Clearly public yeah. purpose. Public purpose. But it's School a private nonprofit. Sure. All right, so it had to achieve an enormous growth in ticket sales in order to build this facility, which just happened to be coincidentally located with a new hospital. Was it, who was building the new hospital? Sutter, Sutter Health yep, was Sutter building Health. the new hospital. And the city wanted Sutter Health to be, rehabilitate an old theater. We like the old theater. In fact, you don't, you, we're not going to give you permission to build the hospital unless you promise to rebuild the theater. Which, which right. is actually a so, deal that a former mayor struck when the hospital was first proposed. Fine, yeah. but, but, but then they go to city council, and city council says, well, we're happy to have the Sutter Hospital, the employment and everything else. We're happy to have imposed on you the need to rebuild the theater, but we don't want to pay for it, don't think we should pay for it. No different than Libby Schaaf saying, I'm not paying for rehabilitation of the Raiders Stadium, mm -hmm. okay? Which I agree with. Mm -hmm. I don't think any stadium in the country should be paid for by the public sector, ever, okay? So, how do you solve that problem, right? I met Kate, actually, at a conference at the Presidio Institute in June, where I met her for the first time. And they were talking about place-based investing, crowdsource funding, the kind of convergence of philanthropy, private investing, and public sector funding. And we got into a really rich conversation about what that spectrum looks like, and B Street Theater's on that spectrum. Mm -hmm. They live on that spectrum somewhere. So, you know, how do you piece together, and the technical term of art internationally for this is multilateral financing. I'm, some, many of you may have never heard of it, but multilateral financing means cutting across different types of institutions, public, private, philanthropic, churches, whatever you could think of, multilateral agencies like the U.S. Import-Export Bank, OPEC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, JBIC, sovereign wealth funds. There's so many different people treading and trolling in the world of multilateral finance. Why do you care to hear this? Because in the United States, given that we have a very challenging situation in terms of funding things, and not all things fit the public rubric. They don't all fit the, fit the public they template. Don't. We've just got to get a hell of a lot better at snapping those pieces together. And that includes crowdsource, crowd, things like crowdsource funding or place-based investing. So, so one quick thing, I know it's hard to watch this and not want to jump in. Because I have my iPad here with all these questions for them, if you want to tweet me at Steve for SAC, I will ask your question if it fits into the conversation. What, one question I have, I don't, but, I don't know where you are in this, but I did, did, would but, like to ask you if possible to talk about integrated delivery for a moment. Yes, but I, I just want to go back because I think that the applause about public financing of uh, sports facilities <laughs> hits me in my core <laughs> because Sacramento, and He's I supported it. it, participated <laughs> in it. bringing a suburban arena down to our city core. And we brought it from having no public transit access to being at the nexus of our public transit. We took an old uh, downtown mall, which had been a failed experiment, uh, and we're able to repurpose it, but we also entitled one and a half million square feet of retail at the same time. Our financing came in lower than we thought because the deal we struck, um, we're ending up paying somewhere around 20% of the actual cost, but it's a publicly owned building, but we're also getting a $500 million hotel next door, and we've spurred um, the turnover of about 20 uh, significant properties that have been sold to somebody, people who are, redoing them. And so when we looked at it, it wasn't just the actual um, arena, which was for basketball. I also looked at it for music and those other things because a lot of the major concerts had passed us by. But this other opportunity to reset our tax base in our central city, re bring housing and all those other things. And it has appeared to not only lift that, but the actual financing we were able to execute was very sophisticated. And the deal we struck with the team turned out to be a lot better than people expected um, in the end. And so I don't think that there's actually a good rule. And uh, Micah Weinberg, who is the staff for the Barrier Council Economic Institute, did a arena study for me. I commissioned him as a council member when I was uh, trying to make my decision. And it turned out there were some horrible deals out there, but there were some examples of what a good deal could look like and what the factors are that could make a good deal. And so to, to Rick's earlier point, I do think there's a sophistication issue sometimes, but there's also the need not to get swept up in just being excited or totally opposed. 
And I think that the, there's a sweet spot in the middle where we can marry the public and private to catalyze a lot of other things. And, 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 and I guess I feel strongly because I voted for it, but also it's working for us. So Steve, I, you know, I understand your defensiveness, but the, um, <laughs> it, it's actually Peter's turn, Rick, not yours. Uh, Peter, well, Peter what were you gonna great. say? <laughs> but the, uh, I actually think we're wasting our breath debating that issue. Yeah. I, I think the most important issue is, is because, look, testosterone and municipal egotism will always drive stadium deals. Um, the, uh, how, do, how do you really feel? But the, uh, but, the, but the reality is I want to figure out how we fund uh, replacing lead pipes. I want to figure out yeah. how we fund um, uh, low-income neighborhoods uh, having the same kind of amenities that that, that are now driving gentrification the likelihood, uh, in other neighborhoods. The likelihood that, that a public entity will sit across the table from an NFL franchise and have a conversation that's balanced, transparent, where the public entity wins and the NFL franchise loses is zero. There's a reason they call them Buccaneers and Raiders. <laughs> it's zero. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, they'll outsmart them every time. In my, uh, they'll outlast them, outspend them, and outsmart them every time. Except in Sacramento. That, that's so what we'll, I see. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but I think, you know, the, the other question about will you, can you generate the capital in some of these other parts of cities that we're talking about in downtowns? Because there's, that's there's the also part. this tension between, well, no more for downtown. We want the big new theater in this disadvantaged neighborhood. And uh, those are difficult things because you can't always make it come together, and if you do, it often has a bigger price, but also doesn't the revenue we raise through property tax and other things benefit the whole city? That, that's not to say that uh, when you replace pipes and have good infrastructure and have ultimately lower utility rates because you've done a good job over generations managing that, that you but aren't a good place mixing, for investment. You're mixing metaphors. Take, take Mayor Shaft as an example. On Shaft or Shaft? Shaft, on the, on okay. the, as an example, on the Raiders Stadium. She said she was more than happy to use tax increment to fund infrastructure. Fair is fair. Transportation, whatever it takes, tax increment. That's fair. What, what she's not willing to do is fund luxury boxes. And they did that last time, and they lost their money. But, but I'll tell you, you know, since we're debating this, I'd rather get back to the Philadelphia thing, but Libby Schaff never had tax increment financing to spend because the governor took it away from her after spending a lot of tax increment financing in Oakland to build the Fox Theater and to do a lot of other things. So I, th I think that's a false equivalence. No, no, no. There's other kind. There, you form a Mellow Roost district. Look, look what's happening to the TJPA in downtown uh, San Francisco. You can form a Mellow Roost district, right? And you can fund through tax increment financing. We're going to lose our, our, yeah. our non california So, so let's, let, let, let's, let's get back here. <laughs> let's get back to integrated delivery. Yeah, that let's get back fun. to You wanted to talk about that, and I think yeah. that's... Well, the reason I wanted to talk about it is because Kate did okay. such a nice job in her, in, her, in her introductory presentation of raising the specter of what we call innovation. Lyft, Uber, these really cool things that are going on out there that are just certainly disruptive. I mean, they're really disruptive. A lot of people are excited about them. So I kind of come back. I was at a conference that McKenzie put on down at Half Moon Bay recently, a really good one. And they were talking, they, it was a, it was, they, brought, they brought in uh, Uber and they brought in Google and all these uh, technology companies to talk about infrastructure. And we had a two-day conversation about it and, and, and the idea of integrated delivery, right? Now their idea of integrated delivery has a little bit of what's mine is mine, what yours is mine in it. In other words, you know, we're gonna come in and help you. That's what Google's saying in its transportation strategy. We're here to help you, right? No, you're here to collect large data and make money. That's what you're here for. That's your business. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But how do you balance the city's interest against Google's interest? How do you create that equation so that it works in the right way? So when I think about integrated delivery, I think it's really, really important you know, on two levels. One is a sort of technical, tactical level, and the other is a strategic level to ask yourself what it means. And I think the level of awareness in this audience, particularly below that $100 million threshold where you can't hire experts to answer the question, it's very important to answer for yourself what it means. And let me just give you one example, just sort of throwing it off the cuff, and maybe we can talk about it for a minute, or you can move on if you want. 
But take, take for example, the EPA mandates across the country on stormwater uh, uh, remediation. And the fact that most wastewater plants in cities aren't, don't have the capacity to absorb all that stormwater. Well, there's an integrated delivery strategy which is very hard to communicate to cities, and it goes like this. Combine your local streets and road program with your stormwater runoff strategy, with your wastewater plant, with combined heat and, heat and power, and with potable reuse. Well, that is about 10 different strategies articulated in one sentence. And most cities are saying, I'm having trouble executing on one strategy, let alone integrating 10 strategies. If you're going to integrate four, five, six strategies or projects into one strategy, how the heck do you do that faster, cheaper, better, and at a lower cost in a sort of contemporary city environment? It's a little bit like going back to the fact that, you know, due to the, the National Insurance Institute would say to you, um, well, firefighters fight fewer fires because we have better safety today than we used to, and really we have an underutilized resource. So the potential of integrated delivery is an underused, underutilized resource, but it's really, really hard to plan and execute given the current skills that exist in cities. And it's a perfect analog for new partners for smart growth, right? Mm -hmm. New partners for smart growth is about bringing um, law enforcement, about health professionals, about planners, about architects, about developers, about community development folks, about social equity activists and putting them together to work across these silos. And local policymakers. And local policymakers, and work across these silos and these lines uh, in order to make things work. We need the same mindset inside city and county governments, that we don't have these silos of a police department, a fire department, etc. Perfect. Yeah. And we need to also, um, and, and this is where Peter and I and Steve are, are in agreement, three white guys, not, no surprise. <laughs> um, the, uh, that we're in agreement that we also need to be willing to cross the public sector, private sector boundaries. We need, to, we need to figure out we've got shared problems. The private sector is not going to thrive if the public sector services are in ruins, right? The public sector, if, if the public sector cannot maintain Detroit, private sector will disinvest. Conversely, if Santa Monica does a remarkably good job of uh, creating the quality of life and the basic infrastructure, we have to fight business off, right? I mean, that's, that's the challenge. So we do our job, we do it together, and we cross these boundaries, we can, to use a phrase we've heard a lot lately, make America great again. Let me well, just say one more thing on integrated yeah, delivery. You go. Yeah. Uh, I, on a, I, said, I was describing it on the strategic level. I want to say one thing on the tactical level that I think will appeal, appeal to this audience. When you move down to the tactical level on integrated delivery, you're getting into really specific things that most people don't talk about every day, like SCADA systems and wastewater plants or uh, traffic control systems in cities and how they actually work. What you find is the workforce is not prepared to deliver those. So there's a workforce development issue there, and I think it really goes local if you want to employ people locally. So I think in order to do integrated delivery at the tactical level, at the strategic level, you're bringing the brain trust in, mm -hmm. and you're really trying to figure the big picture out. At the tactical level, you're saying, we could run a wastewater plant with combined heat and, how, heat, heat and power using very sophisticated technology, and we could you know, improve global greenhouse gas emission output, but you, gotta have a more, you, you just have to have a far more sophisticated workforce. So given that most of the workforce is now retraining, and we have a whole bunch of people coming up that need jobs, how are you going to solve that? Because I'd like to see local people in those communities who need the jobs get the jobs. We're told this all the time. Would you please employ local people who need the jobs? But you've got to have workforce training. You've got to have a way, short of sending everybody to college and accumulating a large amount of debt, um, to employ these people. One, I think we have a couple questions that have come in that I want to ask since we're getting short on time. But back to being able to deliver services, you have to not only have the revenue coming in to deliver the basic uh, services, which is to hire the uh, police, firefighters, other planners, but you also have to have the resources to invest back into the infrastructure and everything else so that you don't uh, shrink as a city, um, you don't get disinvestment. And I don't think that's an easy challenge, especially given the pressures, particularly on cities and counties across the country. It's very difficult right now, and that's why bringing some of these new uh, methods to the table, um, to use your earlier phrase, causes us to think 
uh, because we don't have the money. So one of the questions that came in was how um, entities like an iBank can help mid-sized cities with large public works projects, maybe in the, the $500 million range, manage those things? Or are there tools out there from the federal government or others that can, can do that? Well, I think when you get to the mid-size, the, the, just as a fact that should be discussed, the iBank is not currently capitalized with an adequate amount of equity to do $500 million projects. So they don't, they're not set up for that. They've set themselves up with the smaller amount of equity that they've been given by the legislature in California to do the smaller projects under $100 million. That's just sort of the way it's been worked historically. That said, there's an effort in the iBank right now that comes out of the governor's initiatives around greenhouse gas emissions and the Paris Accord and everything else to use cap and trade dollars to put a green bank inside the iBank that would be capitalized with a larger amount of money to do energy efficiency projects of the scale that you described. So take, you know, for example, all the public buildings in California. Could we make them all energy efficient? Well, of course, you're not going to do that all at once in one day, but you might do a larger scale implementation of PACE in the public sector. That's the idea. So the answer is yes with the qualification that the iBank is not currently set up to do it. And then I would further say that when you move to the $500 million level, um, you know, I think having the iBank, ha iBank have a center of expertise, noting that uh, John Chang, the, Chung, the treasurer of California, just yesterday put out his triennial infrastructure report, which is required under law in California, he wants to create a center of expertise in the iBank and the Treasurer's Office to give that kind of advice, similar to uh, Partnerships UK, similar to the British Columbia operation and what goes on in Australia. So, you know, would other states do that? There aren't a lot of iBanks around the country. There should be more. There are discussions about creating other iBanks. I'm involved in one with the Treasurer of the state of Illinois right I, now. I guess at the federal level, um, there are loan programs through um, EPA and their clean water funds to, to make loans to jurisdictions to do things like that. Well, the and, complaint about that is it doesn't provide early stage development capital. The higher risk early stage development capital, which, which is what you need to get a project off the ground, right. they provide loans once you know you want, what you want to do. Yeah. And if this is making any of your head hurt, um, then, then the... <laughs> Sorry. No, no, that's the point. That is, if, if, if we take anything away from this hour, I hope it's this. We have to democratize capital, right? We have to, you have to understand, just like you can't live in 2016 and not know about technology, right? It, it's not enough to say, oh, I'm not, I'm not a tech person, right? You, you, because then you're, you're defaulting to the people who are tech people, right? So we cannot default on becoming sophisticated in the public sector about public and private finance. That's where the money is for all the things we want to do, all the things we need to do, and making sure that they happen in ways that are more democratic and equitable than they would happen if we just leave it to the private sector. So we have to get in the game. That means all of you have to read the business press. That means all of you have to start paying attention to global flows of capital and to how to finance projects and to what's going on in your city and county budget. That's where the money is. I, I want to squeeze in one. That was aspect. beautifully said, too. Yeah. Beautifully said. Yeah. He deserves that round of applause. <laughs> Sorry to step on your applause. Um, people should ask <laughs> only uh, fair, about Steve. this uh, uh, green, uh, green Bank that Peter was talking about, because I think it's really fascinating. But I want to flip the coin. Uh, we did get a question about how do we get these investments and partnerships into low-income communities that don't fit profit models for banks but that need the investment. And, and you know, we've, we've talked about how public entities might use it. We've talked about how, uh, but is there a way to democratize, to use uh, Rick's word, into these communities a, a, a funding model that can help them empower themselves? You know, my, 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 I'm talking about over 100 million now, and we can talk about under 100 million in a minute. Let me just start with over 100 million. If you look at the pipeline of projects that I pursue across the country, I'm switching now away from the iBank back over to Tabor Rock Capital, which is private capital. Remember, private capital comes from pension funds that have retirees who need to earn money to cover their pension obligations. So it's called asset and liability matching, these long-term contracts that you create by providing infrastructure in cities 
ultimately go to CalPERS and CalSTRS and Ohio Teachers and you know the guys down in Texas. Those are the clients on the on the investor side. So if you, you know it's not Wall Street for me. It's all labor related or public uh, pension funds and some sovereign wealth funds. But anyway, to answer your question, um, there are just as many disadvantaged communities and low income communities on our in our pipeline as there are advantaged. And I would say when I think about the projects that work, after we're done doing all the multilateral research, which includes the SRF, the EPA Finance Center, what are, or TIFIA, or any of the other things that are available out there, you know, I think it's just about equally likely that you'll do a project in a disadvantaged community as an advantaged community with one qualification. You have to have someone in the disadvantaged community who's smart enough and sophisticated enough to solve the problem that you talked about, which is make sure that they're equipped to be smart enough on their side of the table to have the conversation to carry it through to a conclusion. And, and that's very, very important. And let me tell you something that might surprise you when I've got my private sector hat on. I walk away from projects that don't have that. Why do I walk away from projects that don't have that? Because they end up costing a fortune and they usually don't get done. Yeah. They, you know, I would rather the public sector be informed and it be transparent and work and have somebody on the other side of the table who's actually competent than have somebody on the other side of the table who's crazy, who, you know, who may vote for it and then against it and then for it and then against it five times during the process, which costs a fortune and usually results in it not happening. So we're gonna leave it at that. Please join me in thanking Rick and Peter. Thank you very much. And thank you all.